Check. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to lecture 15. We are talking about moving fluids still today. Um, and in particular, we're talking about fluid kinematics. Uh, I don't know if you know what that means, but basically it means we're considering the ways in which fluid velocity fields move, fluid flow fields move, without considering what forces are acting on them to make them move. All right, so we're going over the first three sections of chapter four. So Eulerian versus Lagrangian flow descriptions, uh, what it means if we say a flow field is two-dimensional, steady and steady flow, streamlines, and then we'll start to get into control volume. All right, let me just switch over to my trusty um, annotator here. All right, so let's go full screen. Yes, yes. Okay, so we just went over these slides and we're here at the velocity field. So if we look at some of the figures here, here we've got our three Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, and Z, and the little unit vectors that describe those directions, I, J, and K. And so here we've got a streamline in red through three-dimensional Cartesian space. And at one point on the streamline, we see what the velocity vector looks like there. Remember, a streamline is a line where the velocity vector is always tangent to it. So here's our velocity vector V. The velocity can be described in its three components in the three directions. So if we write it down, the velocity V, it is a vector. So I don't have a way to, I prefer bolding, but I don't have a way to do that with the annotator. So I'm just indicating it's a vector with a line over it. So it's u in the x direction, and that's a function in principle of all three space directions plus time. And let's just make sure we don't have any good. Uh, plus v in the y direction, and that's a function in principle, again, of all three spatial variables. And then we've got w in the z direction. Um, and so this is the velocity component in the x direction, right? And then v is the velocity component in the y direction, w is in the z direction. If we think about the position of a fluid particle and describe that by r, Um, like you see on the lower left figure, we can write down the following. And we're going to name this particle. This little guy is going to be named particle A. <laughs> so the position relative to the coordinate system um, is the vector R with the subscript A, just to tell us it's for particle A. So then the velocity of particle A is, of course, the derivative of that particle position, right, as you would expect. Uh, one more thing I want to talk about, which is the magnitude. Oops. Magnitude of the velocity, and so you're probably not surprised to see that it's just um, the components squared and then you take the square root, right? So u squared plus v squared plus w squared, take the square root of all. 
All right. So this is how we describe a velocity field. It has three components in all three Cartesian directions. We can write down its magnitude. And of course, the velocity of a fluid particle is the time derivative of its position. If we look down in the lower right here, we can see something that's really typical for a fluid flow. It's the velocity field, okay? So here we have two square um, bars. They're coming out of the page. And you can see we've got a flow from left to right indicated by that red arrow. And what we see is we plotted, we've got the flow field. It's a complete description of this, in this case, two dimensional flow field or a two dimensional slice through the flow fields. And we have plotted the velocity or measured it at many discrete points in the flow field on a regular grid. And what we see is a little tiny arrow at each one of those grid points that tells us the magnitude and direction of the fluid velocity at that point. Um, so this was probably taken using particle image velocimetry. So using an actual physical experiment, putting it in a wind tunnel or a water tank, um, and then seeding the flow with little particles and shining a laser sheet to see how those little particles move from time step to time step. All right, let's talk about Eulerian versus Lagrangian flow descriptions. I don't know if you've heard about this. You probably have, uh, particularly if you're in mechanical engineering. But I don't know if you remember my intro video for the class. One of the things I said was fluids can be challenging to describe because there are so many little particles that make up, you know, a volume of air, a volume of water that it's pretty much impossible to track the motion of the individual molecules, right? And so we need to think about describing fluids in a different way, okay? Well, we've done that through the class and what we have usually used is an Eulerian description of fluid flow. So an Eulerian description, you don't follow individual, say water molecules in time and then take all their velocities and write them down. What you do instead is you go to a particular point in the flow field, you let the water molecules flow past and you say, okay, this is the average velocity at this point, you know, X equals two, Y equals three in, in this 2D flow field. So that's an Eulerian description. If we were to actually follow individual fluid particles um, or molecules, that would be a Lagrangian description. So, I'll say for Eulerian, we measure fluid properties at a point in space. And by properties, I mean pressure, temperature, velocity. And for a Lagrangian description, Um, we measure properties of individual fluid particles. You know, you again, have to excuse us fluid dynamicists for this concept of a fluid particle. It's not a real thing, but it means a small volume um, that's infinitesimally, infinitesimally small, but still has enough fluid molecules so that you can have an average pressure and average temperature. So if we look over on the left at this flow field from the previous slide, now I've rotated 90 degrees and we've got flow coming up from the floor around these square rods. Um, if we were to say Let's set the origin here down at the lower left corner. So if we were to define a point A in the flow and measure the velocity, temperature, pressure there, that would be an Eulerian description of the flow field. If on the other hand, we took an individual fluid particle, say particle B, and actually tracked it as it flowed through this flow domain, so let's say B at time T, this is B at time T plus delta T. That's a Lagrangian description of this flow, right? If we 
stay with particle B and somehow we've managed to hook on little temperature sensors, pressure sensors, and we see how the temperature and pressure of particle B changes as it flows through the field, right? That's Lagrangian. Okay, and then just the second example on the bottom right of this page, we have um, a field, a fluid field flowing, again, sort of from the bottom of the page up toward the top, leaning right a little bit. And we've got two different ways of measuring the temperature in this flow field. On the left, we just define a point zero and measure the temperature there over time, right? and that's an Eulerian description. Um, and on the right, we somehow managed to attach a little temperature sensor to um, a fluid particle and follow you know, this individual particle as it moves in time and record its temperature, right? And of course, that's a Lagrangian approach. Like I said, we almost always use Eulerian. Um, approaches to the flow field in this class and in most fluid dynamics classes. In fact, Lagrangian fluid mechanics is sort of a specialty class you would take as a graduate student. All right, let's look at an example of a flow field. So let's imagine we've got this street sign um, on the upper right and there's a wind coming in normal to the sign itself, the part that says Stonebrook Road. Um, and you can see there's a little stagnation point forming right there. And you can see little velocity vectors um, approaching the stagnation point from far away. And we have one symmetry streamline that goes right to the stagnation point, but then above and below that, the fluid streamlines part. Some go up the sign and some go down. All right, so here we want to find the location of the flow field where the flow speed equals V naught for this particular velocity. So we're given the velocity v, and this um, is a vector, is equal to a constant v naught over the constant l times minus x, that's our variable, in the x direction plus y in the y direction. OK, so how do we do this? So by definition, um, we have a two-dimensional flow field. We'll talk about that in a moment. By, by inspection, we can just pick out the x and y components of the velocity field here. Right, so it's equal to minus v naught over L times x in the i direction plus positive v naught over L times y in the J direction, so here's our U velocity and our V velocity. Um, how do we find the flow speed, right? Well, we've got our vector expression for the velocity field. We could, in principle, plug in. We could, you know, define a box around the sign, and we could say, all right, well, you know, well, here we've got axes, right? So this is our x-axis here, and this is our y-axis here. And we could describe any point in that box, in that flow domain, in terms of x and y, plug the x and y values into our velocity expression and see how much velocity is going in the x direction and how much in the y direction, whether it's negative or positive, right? But we also want to be able to calculate the magnitude at any point in the flow field. So to do that, we do what we did a couple slides ago. Um, and we just take the individual components, u and v, square them, and then take the square root. So here it's v without a bar. And it turns out that that's v naught over l times x squared plus y squared square root. Okay, 
So this is the magnitude of the velocity at any point in the flow field. We want to know what locations in the flow field is the magnitude of the velocity equal to V naught. So for V equal V naught, we need um, the rest of the expression. We need X squared plus Y squared square root over L to have a magnitude of one, right? So if we do that, um, that actually is the equation of a circle. And if we consider just X positive and draw in our flow field, Um, it turns out, we'll make a little half circle here, a little half circle here. So this has radius L, radius 2L, radius minus L, radius minus 2L. Um, so when this expression is true, then the circle has a radius of L, right? We can rearrange, just take that L over on the other side, multiply the one by L, and there we go. So basically everywhere on this line, um, V is equal to, e to V naught. So if we were to draw in, um, some velocity vectors, it would look like this. Oh, let me use a different color. Right. Velocity vectors would look like this. This is just choosing x, y points in the flow field and plugging them into our expression for velocity. Right, so that's what our flow field looks like. And in fact, you can see that what, that's what um, they've got sketched over here in the problem as well. All right. Let's talk about one, two, and three dimensional flows. So if we write down the general expression for a fluid velocity field, right? Any velocity component can, in principle, depend on all three Cartesian um, coordinates plus time. Um, how many space coordinates your flow depends on determines the dimensionality of the flow, right? So it doesn't matter if you have U, V, or W components, that doesn't tell you about the dimensionality of your flow field. What matters is how many Cartesian coordinates your flow field depends upon. So let's look at some examples. Let's look at oil flowing over a flat plate like we had on the exam and the homework right before the exam. Right, so here we've got Y and X. And we've got a U velocity. So the velocity is only in the X direction. And the U velocity is a function of Y only, right? So you can imagine taking another snapshot downstream a little bit and you'd see exactly the same picture, right? So that velocity profile does not depend on X, but it does depend on U, right? The magnitude of the velocity increases as you increase in height farther and farther away from the wall. So this is a 1D, one dimensional flow field. It only depends on Y. It's also a steady flow field, right? We're assuming that it's not changing with time. All right, let's look at another example. Now let's imagine a pipe that converges and diverges. And again, we'll make the x-axis along the axis of the pipe. 
and we'll make Y start from the center of the pipe. Now, if this is a regular pipe, we'll, it's going to develop something called Poise flow, which we'll talk about later. But you already saw how if you have a confined flow like this, if you have a wide area, you have a lower velocity. And then when the area constricts, that makes the velocity speed up. You have a higher average velocity, right, by the continuity equation. So we know we're going to have a parabolic parabolic velocity profile that looks something like this. Just take my word for that. Um, but if we move downstream to the constriction, we're going to have a much higher average velocity, right? The length, the average length of that second velocity profile is much longer than the average length of that velocity profile. Um, so what about this field? Now we've only got fluid flowing from left to right along the x-axis, right? So you might be tempted to say, oh, this is a one-dimensional flow field. Um, in actuality, the velocity depends on two variables. So which variables are those? Anyone feeling courageous today? You can put it in chat if you don't feel like talking. X and Y. Yeah, X and Y, right? So it's a two-dimensional flow field. Thank you. So this is 2D, and let's also, you know, assume that it's fixed. So if you look at it at any time, and look at a different time, the flow, even if it changes with space, doesn't look different at different times. All right, so again, remember, the dimensionality of your flow field doesn't matter how many velocity components you have, U, V, W, it depends on how many space coordinates they depend on. All right, let's talk about streamlines, streak lines, and path lines. We've talked about streamlines a lot. Streamlines align where everywhere tangent to the velocity vector. I want to write down a little bit, a, a little equation about streamlines. So let's write our axes in 2D. And then let's write a streamline. And then let's look at a point and just see the velocity vector at that point. So it's going to have components u and v and it's going to be dx extent in the x direction and dy extent in the y direction. Right? So let's write down the definition. Streamline is a line everywhere tangent to the velocity vector. So for 2D flows, we can write down something really handy. Just looking at this little chart, this little sketch I made over on the left, we can write down that dy dx is equal to v over u. This comes in handy. It allows us to actually solve for expressions for streamlines for 2D flows. All right. And we'll look at an example of that in a moment. Streak line uh, consists of all particles that have passed through a common point in a flow. Um, so if you imagine an experiment, you've got something in the water channel, you've got a, I don't know, a helicopter blade and you, you're doing dynamic scaling and so you're testing it in water instead of air. So you've got it underwater and you're putting a laser light on it and you're injecting fluorescent dye. Well, you're injecting the dye at a point, and then your streak line is going to be all the fluid particles that flow away from that point carrying some fluorescent, fluorescent dye with them. All right, and then finally, path lines are just um, lines that individual part of fluid particles make. <clears throat> 
All right. So let's look at the same example again, but now we want to actually calculate and write down expression for the streamlines for this flow, this stagnation point flow. So determine the streamlines for this flow. Okay, well, we found out last time what the u and v velocity components were. We know that u is minus v naught over L times x. And we know that v is positive v naught times L over y. Um, we can find the streamlines by solving the following. Right, dy dx, this is the equation from the last slide, equals v over u. And in this case, that's minus y over x. So we can now um, separate out the variables and integrate this. So we've got the integral of dy over y equals minus the integral of dx over x. Let's do it again. There we go. So this gives us that the natural log of y is equal to minus the natural log of x plus a constant c, or we'll just call it constant. Um, so along a streamline, we have x, y equals a constant. And to visualize the flow field, you would just set, right? So we can rearrange this. We can say that y is equal to c over x. To visualize this, you just set that constant c equal to different values and plot that equation, right? So let's do that. For a few values, sketch out what that looks like. So let's set c equal to 1. If we do that, we get y is 1 over x. And that looks like this. Of course, it doesn't have all those little waves. That's just my unsteady hand here. <laughs> so that's c equals 1. That c equals minus 1. Um, this is what c equals 4 would look like. c equals minus 4. C equals nine would look like this. And the same symmetric streamlines on the lower half, right? Um, the C equals zero, the stagnation streamline, let me draw that in red, comes in along the x-axis like this. And goes right to that stagnation point and then divides and goes up and down the y-axis. And as you can see mathematically, um, if you plug in c equals zero, you just get y equals zero, right? So that's where you get this one from. And then if you rearrange it um, that x is c over y, you can get the other ones as well. OK, we're actually doing really well on time. Does anyone have any questions? Let's keep trekking then. All right, we talked about the velocity field so far. Um, now we'll talk about the acceleration field. You won't be surprised to know that the velocity field, just like the velocity field for a fluid particle, is the time derivative of its position vector. The acceleration field is the time derivative of the velocity vector. But it gets a little tricky now. This is where we diverge from the analogy with just tracking a particle's motion. Because when we take the derivative of the velocity field, we have to take into account the fact that some of the um, fluid components, u, v, or w, might also depend on time. So let's see what I'm talking about here. So we're going to consider a fluid particle moving along its path line like we have in the figure, 
um, we can write down the velocity for this particle. Since this particle is named A again, everything's going to get a subscript A. So the velocity is a vector. And it's a function of the position vector of the fluid particle and time. Or we can write that spread out a little bit uh, like this, just to drive home the point that x, y, and z all depend on time. All right, using the chain rule, we have that the acceleration of particle A is just equal to the derivative with respect to time of the velocity, but here's where it gets a little tricky. We've got the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to time, but then we have to take into account the fact that x, y, and z are functions of time because the particle is changing location as it flows. So now we have dVA dx times dx a dt plus dva dy times dy a dt and then one more term dv vector d z times d z sub a dt right so um, are those partials as well? The dv dx, dv dy, dv dz are partials. And that's because v, the velocity vector, depends on more than one variable, right? It depends on x, y, z, and t. So those are partials. However, the dx dt, dy dt, dz dt, those are not partials because x, y, and z only depend on time, right? So when you take their you're welcome. When you take the derivative, that's it. You're done. Okay. Now we're going to use the fact that um, that we can rewrite dx dt as u. Let's say that. Whoops. Come back here. Okay. So using the fact that the x component of the particle's velocity can be described as dx dt, right? And likewise for the v component and w. Um, we can rewrite the acceleration as follows. dVA dt plus UA dVA dx plus VA dVA dy plus WA dVA dz. Um, or generalizing, because what we've written down is true for any fluid particle. The acceleration for any fluid particle then is equal to dv dt partial, right, times u plus dv dx plus v times dv dy plus w times dv dz. And this is 4.3 in the textbook. Really important equation. Let's talk about these terms a little bit. So this is the expression for the acceleration of a fluid particle or a fluid flow field. Um, a is just the total expression, but then on the right, let's talk about these individual terms. The partial V partial T is called the local acceleration. And then the other ones that depend on spatial derivatives, these are called the convective acceleration. 
So you think about that, the change in the acceleration due to changes in time to the flow field is that first local term, right? But then you also have to account for the fact that if you're a fluid particle and you're moving through space, you're being carried along by the flow field. And so the flow that you experience is changing in space as well. And that's what the convective acceleration terms are for, right? So local acceleration is just due to how the flow field changes in time. Convective acceleration is due to the fact that you, the fluid particle are being invected through space. And so the flow field you're experiencing is changing. All right. Uh, and then I want to just say that this is, let's move this little label over. This is the material derivative of the velocity field. Okay, or the total derivative, you might have seen it. I'm sure you've seen this in your calculus class, right? But when you see the derivative with that capital D by capital DT, that means you've got a local time term plus convective terms that um, involve spatial derivatives. All right, any questions so far? Okay, see that. So this can do kind of funny things, right? We're used to really thinking of acceleration as just being the derivative of the velocity with time. So it can be a little counterintuitive sometimes. So let's look at this pipe with a changing diameter. So in this upstream portion from x1 to x2, First, you've got a constant diameter portion and then it converges and the area, the diameter and the cross-sectional area gets smaller. And then from X2 to X3, it re-expands slowly, right? So here you've got a constant velocity. It's one dimensional, it's, z it's zero dimensional. Well, well we, we'll call it one dimensional because as you move in the X direction, the velocity changes, right? So this is a one dimensional flow field. But this particular location, it's constant. It's got a value of V1 no matter where you are. Obviously, this is a frictionless flow because if it weren't, you would have friction eating away the velocity at the walls and you would get that parabolic profile, right? But we don't have that here. Um, so it goes the, through the constriction and then of course it's a little accelerated. So you can see that at this location X2, the velocity vectors are a little longer by conservation of mass, right? The flow rate has to stay the same because there's no flow sink or source. So if it's moving through a smaller area, it's got to speed up to get the same amount of stuff through in the same time. And then if we go all the way down to position X3, it's expanded, re-expanded a little bit. It's uh, slowed down a little bit, right? So now if we were to ask ourselves, well, first of all, I wanna rewrite the acceleration a little in, in terms of its components, right? So we can write the acceleration in the X direction as du dt plus u du dx plus v du dy plus w du dz. You can do the same thing for the other two velocity components, dv dt plus u dv dx plus v dv dy plus w dv dz. And you can tell how this third one's going to go. It's dw dt plus u dw dx plus v dw dy plus W, whoops, gave the W an extra curl there. There we go, W, DW, DZ, right? So these are our acceleration components. So again, looking at the flow through this pipe on the top, we've only got flow in the X direction. We've only got that, so this is the equation that we've got. We don't have any v velocity. We don't have any w velocity. So we're going to find that we don't have any accelerations in those directions either. 
Um, so it's a uniform steady flow. So if someone asked you, is there an acceleration in this pipe? You, you first, the, the first thing you might want to say is no, there's not, right? Because dv dt is zero, but we have non-zero convective terms. Right? So if we look at the first portion between x1 and x2, um, we can see that the flow speeds up, right? The average flow increases from position one to position two, from x1 to x2, right? So we can see we've got du dx greater than zero. And that implies uh, an acceleration greater than zero, right? And likewise, if we look between x2 and x3, we've got the opposite. We've got du dx is less than zero. The flow speed slows down. So that implies that we've got an acceleration that's negative, right? So I hope that makes sense. Um, all right, any questions? Now we've got just one more slide. Uh, okay, control volumes. So now we are going to, as you know, this course is called Fluids One Control Volumes, right? So we're really getting into the meat of the course now. Um, in Fluids One, you approach how to solve a lot of pretty complicated fluid flow problems without having to use the differential equations that govern fluid dynamics, the Navier-Stokes equations, right? Instead, we do some clever tricks. We define volumes of fluid, and we write down the forces on the surfaces of those volumes. So let's talk about that for just a couple moments. Um, so here we've got three examples, um, and we need to make a distinction between a control volume and a system. Okay, and we're going to be talking about this a lot next week. So first example here, we've got flow through a pipe. Um, along the axis of the pipe. And then what you see in dashed in orange is the control volume, the surface of the control volume, right? And then at one instant in time, we've got a collection of fluid particles, they're shaded blue here, that's inside that control volume. And so for this instant in time that we're looking at this leftmost figure, the system and the control volume coincide. So let's write down these definitions. System is just a collection of the same fluid particles. So if we're in a situation like pipe flow, like we see here on the upper left, and you control and you define a control volume at this location in the pipe, you're going to have your system of fluid particles, tagged fluid particles in your control volume for a split second and then they're gone downstream, never to be seen again, right? Um, now the control volume is a volume in space uh, that has fluid particles flowing through it. It can actually be moving in space. Most of the time it's not, most of the time it's fixed. All right, so let's look at the second example here in the middle up top. So now we have a really simplified sketch of a jet engine. And you can see the streamlines going above, below, and through the engine from the intake to the outlet. And we've got two different times here. So again, we've got our control volume surface indicated by this orange dashed line. But now we're at time T1 and we define at this time T1, whatever fluid 
is inside the jet is our system. Okay, so those particular fluid particles. Now, just a moment later, at time T2, that system of fluid particles has exited the jet and it's downstream, right? It's gone. <laughs> Uh, and that's shaded dark blue now. And it's, of course, it's not gonna be this nice rectangular shape, but that's how we're representing it here for simplicity, right? So control volume's in the same place where it was relative to the jet engine, but the fluid system is gone. It's exited the jet engine, it's exited the control volume, right? We're gonna do a lot where we say, where we consider a moment in time and consider forces on the control volume and forces on the fluid system but just you know, keep in mind that as time passes in a flow, our original system goes away, gets convected away. Interesting note with this problem, uh, this control volume around this jet engine, it's fi fixed with respect to the jet engine, but of course, if this jet is flying, they're both moving through space, right? So you can also have moving control volumes. That's not a problem. All right, the third type of control volume um, that I wanna talk about is a deforming control volume, which you can also have. So again, we've got the orange dashed line that indicates the surface of the control volume that wraps around the air inside this balloon. The control volume sitting just inside the rubber, the latex of the balloon, right? So it's just containing all the air, but not the balloon itself. And this control volume is deforming with time. So as the air exits the balloon, the balloon deflates, the control volume gets smaller and smaller, right? So um, you'll see examples like that sometimes too. But again, no problem to be to have a control volume that's not only moving, but a control volume that's actually changing shape with time. As long as you're able to describe the way the shape changes or approximate it, you can do an amazing amount um, with deforming control volumes. All right, we're doing great. Last slide. Um, we're in chapter four now. So Hyungan is gonna solve this list of four problems from the textbook. And it's about velocity, fluid velocity fields, fluid acceleration fields, and control volumes. Um, and I just wanted to note, because I was out on Monday, um, the quiz and homework are shorter than normal, right? So typically the quiz is maybe 10, 12 questions. The homework is five or six questions. This week the quiz is five questions and there are three homework problems and they're a little bit <clears throat> on the lighter end as well. All right, that's all I've got for today. Do you guys have anything for me? Any questions? All right, well, I hope that you fine humans are all doing well and um, Thanks for coming and I will see you guys. I am feeling better. Thank you so much. I appreciate the good wishes. And we will see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend.